Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And today I'm continuing my discussions with Larry Swedro, who is head of financial and economic research at Buckingham Wealth Partners. You can learn more about his story in episode six, four, five. Larry deeply understands the world of academic research about investing and especially risk and asset management and all of that. And He's recently written a piece called The Self-Healing Mechanism of Risk Assets. And what a great opportunity to learn from the man. So Larry, take it away. Yeah, so one of the biggest problems that I have found uh, working with both advisors uh, and investors directly is this kind of biases which lead to mistakes which we have talked about in previous episodes, one of them being recency. So recency is the tendency to extrapolate the recent uh, performance of assets, almost ad infinitum into the future as if it's inevitable. Uh, and another is a problem of engaging in resulting, which is, as we've talked about, is making the mistake of judging the quality of a decision by the outcome, which is unknown, uh, versus uh, judging it by the quality of the decision-making process. And so if you think, for example, that diversification is a prudent strategy, right? Mm. Uh, just to use a simple example, maybe you should own stocks and safe bonds, some combination of them, and then stocks go on to far outperform. You say, what a dummy I was, I bought these bonds. And then, of course, you can have period when stocks uh, underperform totally riskless treasury bills for as long as 17 years. Uh, so that's a mistake we know. It's no different than, say, you have a young couple, they have children, and they decide to not take out life insurance, and next 10 years, they're lucky enough nobody dies, uh, and thinking that that was a good decision from a financial perspective. Mm. You cannot judge the quality of a decision by the outcome because alternative universes, uh, to use a Star Trek term, could have easily played out. So you can only judge it by the quality uh, of your decision making. And, and I, we I know, would, for example, would, diversification is a prudent strategy. I, I would highlight episode 601, where I interviewed Annie Duke, who's written some books and highlighted the the value of what you're talking about resulting. So, yeah. That's terrific. So the problem it comes about, uh, we know, when stocks or any asset class performs very poorly. And so investors then flee uh, because of these mistakes that they make and they fear the worst outcome, but they fail to understand some basic economic principles, which I use the term that there's a self-healing mechanism that's generally in place. So if we think about this, we ask ourselves, how do bear markets happen? Well, they happen for two reasons. One is earnings can fall, and of course, stock prices would fall appropriately, but you get really severe bear markets when you have the combination of things happening, you get earnings falling, and then the risk premium goes up because we're in a bad recession or there's a war or some geopolitical events, whatever it might be. And people now are willing to pay much lower PEs for the same earnings. And so you get, say, a 25, 30% drop in earnings, but PEs get cut in half and markets crash, right? Well, what investors fail to understand, but Warren Buffett uh, understood uh, all that, you know, along, and that's what made him a great investor, is that when valuations fall, that's an effect telling you what the cost of capital is to corporations, right? Uh, if valuations are falling, the cost of capital is going up because they have to give away, for example, let's say PEs went from 20 to 10. Well, you had to give, you only had to give away uh, for every dollar of earnings, you got 20 bucks for your stock, but now you're only getting 10. 
So mm. your cost of capital went way up. But if you're buying the stock, now you only have to pay $10 to get a dollar of earnings. That's a 10% return instead of 20 times earnings, which is only a 5% return. So I, the simple examples I show people is, so there are these three periods when stocks to got crushed for a long period of time. Most people would never guess that this even happened once, I think. But 1929 to 43, T-bills outperformed stocks. That's 15 years. Now, what happened during that period? The cyclically adjusted P.E. ratios, what's called the Schiller Cape 10, had fallen from 25.3 to less than 11. So now stocks are looking much more attractive. We have this self-healing mechanism. And what happened? Well, from 1944 to 65, a much longer 22-year period, stocks returned 15% outperformed riskless T-bills by 13.2%, almost double the historical risk premium. Similarly, what we saw from 66 to 83, that's the longest period in the US that we have where stocks underperformed T-bills, at least in the modern era, post-1926. And then the Cape 10 fell from about 20 all the way down to under 10. And again, that's Warren Buffett's telling people, don't try to time the market, but buy when everyone else is panicking and sell when others are getting greedy. And so over the next 16 years, from 1984 through 1999, the S&P returned 18.1%, outperformed T-bills by 12.3%. Well, then, of course, that big outperformance works the other way. The, you know, of course, what happened is valuations went way up uh, to 44.2, and then the market went down the next 13 years from 2012. Again, the S&P underperforms T-bills. But by that time, the Cape 10 had been cut by more than half down to 21.2, which was less than the average of the last 25 years, a little higher than the historical average. And again, over the next decade or so, the S&P far outperforms. So the way to think about it is fall falling earnings is bad, but falling valuations is a self-healing mechanism. And just as one last example here, the S&P lost 18.1% in 2022. We have a self-healing mechanism. The Cape 10 went from 38 to, to about 28. That's still pretty high, mm. but it's a lot better. And stocks went on to have strong returns. Right now, those strong returns put the Cape 10 up at 33. That's been a period when usually stocks do very poorly. But my last comment is this on that. The one-year correlation between the Cape 10 or current PEs and stock returns is virtually zero. Mm. You cannot use this information to time the market. But it does provide you information about what is likely to happen over the long term. And that means you have to have patience in order to stay the course. So is the, uh, is the lesson like when you finally get absolutely exhausted of a terribly performing market after you know five years, 10 years, it just seems like I give up. That's the time that you should be saying, okay, now it's time to add more to my position. Actually, I would say it's that's the time you want to rebalance and get back to your you know, uh, risk target that you said is what you think is appropriate based upon your ability, willingness, and need to take risk. Now, the self-healing mechanism doesn't only work between stocks and bonds. It works between value and growth stocks. Uh, so a good example of that, in the late 90s, uh, 95 through 99, as an example, the S&P returned 33.6% per annum, the S&P 500 growth index and dramatically outperformed small value stocks by almost 13% a year. 
Well, of course, the spread in valuations between small value and large growth stocks widen to historic proportions. And the best predictor we have is the relative PE ratios. And of course, over the next eight years, small value went out to dramatically outperform, outperformed the S&P 500 growth index by 14.3% per annum mm -hmm. over the next eight years. But most investors weren't there because they were subject to recency bias, chasing past returns, and engaging in resulting. Um, so one of the, um, I'll tell you a funny story, uh, Larry, that the former finance minister of Thailand, who is uh, was a finance minister many years ago, he also was a pioneer in the financial markets here in Thailand. Uh, I, I really uh, have a lot of respect for the guy. He's very smart. Uh, so he's been, you know, investing in all that for many, many years. But on Sunday, February 4th, he wrote a an article, you know, and the Thai stock market has been terrible for, I don't know, five, 10 years now. And the article is titled, why I pulled all my investments out of the Thai stock market. And I thought to myself, I thought to myself that I need to write the article in the, the same newspaper to say, that's the signal that we're <laughs> at the end of this period. In fact, I think I need to get him on the podcast to debate that and discuss that. But um, I think the, the point is, is that when you feel exhaustion, is the point that you may, you know, you may actually make your best, uh, your most profitable decision if you can go against the exhaustion. Yeah, that, I think the key is that the basic underlying premises of why you made the investment have to remain the same. So for example, if you invested, uh, say in, I'll just make this up, in Thailand because you saw good governance, you know, uh, good democracy, mm -hmm. uh, assets had, you know, gov uh, government protection for private yeah. property, governments weren't taking over pro companies and, you know, um, taking them out of the public domain, and taxes would go way up. If those underlying basic principles are no longer there, you may want to change your, your view. But if the basic premises for why you made the investment haven't changed, it's just that the risk showed up, well, then you should be in effect doubling down or rebalancing because the story just got better because you're now having to pay a much lower price for the same amount of earnings. So that's what's key. And when you talked about PE, you really referenced the, the concept of risk. Do you look at, let's say, a PE ratio or that type of thing? Do you is is that risk, or how do you look at at PE? No, P, PE uh, is a measure of the cost of capital, if you will, of a company. A high PE ratio means the company has to give away a lower amount of capital to get a you know to, uh, has to give up fewer earnings to get the same amount of capital. And investors are willing to pay a higher PE. In two for two reasons. One, the expected growth rate is higher. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's a safer investment. Riskier companies have to have higher risk premiums, higher expected returns to entice investors. So that's what most people don't understand. They think this company's safe, it's got to have great returns. No, risk and ex ante expected returns have to be inversely related. So, so if a company that, that's what's true. if a company was trading on 20 times, it mean we could take one divided by 20 and come up with five percent. That would be the earnings yield. And yep. historically, whether we look at the one year, the five year average or the Cape five or the Cape eight or the Cape 10, that's about as good a predictor we have of future long term returns uh, and in real terms. So a 20 PE would translate into a 5% earnings yield. And then you would say, I would expect to earn 5% in real terms over the long term for stocks. And then you could look at, say, in the US, we would look at difference, say, between a 10-year TIPS, an inflation-protected security, and a 10-year bond. And that today would be roughly 2%. 
and we'd add 2% to the five to get a nominal expected return to stocks of about seven. That's how you would do it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. And um, one, one last thing, I think uh, you, you mentioned that it's, if you look at just trying to predict one year's forward performance <clears throat> from the Cape 10, let's say ratio, um, you know, you're, you're just going to, you're, you're just getting noise, basically. You're, you're getting yeah. randomness and stuff like that. Um, but, but also if we look at right now and look at the situation and look at the PE right now, I mean, it is quite high. What do we derive from, the, even though it has had some self-healing happen, as you said, what do we derive from that? Well, it's gone reverse after 2013. 2023, right? Because of the very strong 26%. Here's the, the important thing. And then I want to come back mm. because I want to show your audience that the self-healing mechanism not only works with stocks and value versus growth, it works with bonds and credit, and it works with insurance and virtually any risk asset. Uh, but the right way to to think about uh, this issue, uh, Andrew, is as follows. What does a high current PE tells you? This is a mistake that many investors make. First of all, the current PE or the Cape 5 or 10 all have an explanatory power of about 40%. So what that tells you is that if you have a 20 PE current or a Cape 10, the expected real return over the net over the long term, not the next one year, uh, is 5% in real terms. However, what's really important to understand is you have to think about that expected return as the median of a wide potential dispersion of outcomes that are possible. So if you look at the data, it goes something like this. If you have a Cape 10 of about, say, 17, the historical return to stocks may have been about seven real returns. However, in the best 10 year periods, the real return might have been 13. And in the worst, it might have been plus two. And if you have a PE of 10, that's projecting really high, you know, uh, future returns of 10. But you could still get some years maybe that are low, like maybe three or four percent. Mm. Or you can get some good years where it's 15. And the reason is you have regime changes and risk can either show up causing PEs, future PEs to collapse or good news to show up or bubbles and returns can go way up. That's the part that John Bogle called the speculative return, the change in the P.E. ratio, which can happen because, you know, hey, we get a great economic environment. Peace breaks out all over the world. Russia walks away from Ukraine. Hamas surrenders, uh, you know, all these kinds mm -hmm. of things. Inflation goes away. The Fed declares victory. Rates come down around the world and stock prices go up. Now, no one would predict that by looking at the current PEs, but that's a change in regime that's unforecastable. So the key is high valuations predict low median returns and the best returns possible become less good and the worst returns become much worse. Low valuations predict higher returns, but you can still get bad returns, but not as bad as when the valuations are high and the best returns are much better than the best returns when valuations are high. Um, one of the That's things, the way to think about it. Okay, that's great. And one of the things someone said to me a long time ago was they said, the um, Andrew, you said that the stock market's efficient, but you know, if I just look past you know a year ago and I compare to now, we weren't, you know, the stock market wasn't it wasn't really forecasting very accurately compared to what happened. I said, wait a minute, <laughs> the stock market is, is, is ultimately digesting all the information we have at that time. And, and just because when, when new information comes in, it adjusts for that. So to say that the stock market in the future went down or up 
very different from what people expected. You're not saying that the market's not efficient. What you're just saying is that new information came and the market efficiently processed that information and decided to derate or re-rate. Exactly. It's the new information that comes out that's better or worse than expected. But let me give you a good example to help you if you ever have that discussion about okay, market please. efficiency. So there is something called the wisdom of crowds. I'm sure you're familiar yep. with uh, Sawicki's work uh, mm. on that and shows that crowds, when they are not heard behaving, right, and influenced by the behavior of the crowd, but individually thinking, are generally better forecasters than the experts, okay? And what here's the data. The Wall Street Journal does a survey of, of market forecasts every year. And they looked at the, I think they looked at <clears throat> 23 strategists. And they go back, a recent piece uh, done by an investment firm, looked at the last six years to see how they did. Last year, the average forecast before 2023 was for a plus six. They were only off by 20% collectively. <laughs> no one got as high as the market actually turned out. And some actually predicted down for the market. The interesting thing is that is normal. The average error from the median forecast over the last six years was no better. In other words, it was at least off by 14% from the actual outcome. That's telling you how efficient the market is, right? Because if otherwise, everyone would be able to forecast exactly mm. what was going to happen. <clears throat> All these active managers who are geniuses would be able to tell you, well, the market, no, they can't, and they can't exploit it. Uh, they are unable to predict what will happen and therefore, you could argue the market's efficient. And I, I took that down to a stock level for my dissertation a, a while back and looked at the performance of individual analysts forecasting individual stocks. And I came out with a 25% error rate, basically 25% optimism worldwide. Yeah. So, yes, I confirm. Um, You were talking about other asset classes and talking about you know, buying, you know, and, and you were using the PE for stocks, but you were saying that this also applies to other asset classes. What were you going to say about that? Yeah. So let's deal with corporate credits uh, <laughs> as a first example that everyone can relate to. So a 208 happens and you get, you know, big defaults, right? Now, what, what's going to happen when that happens? What do lenders do? They tighten up their lending standards, right? Right. Uh, they require, say, if we were going to make a real estate loan, to make an example, they may have lent willing to lend 70% of the market value at that time. And after that crisis, maybe they were only willing to lend 40%. So the risk just went way down. And what happens to spreads? Well, the banks are short capital. Uh, are people unwilling to lend? They're nervous, bad times. The spreads over riskless treasury bills widen dramatically. So you have much higher expected returns from the wider spreads. And the risk has come down because the underwriting standards have tightened. And so you get the self-healing mechanism by working credit. Another great example is the asset class of reinsurance. So we went through periods in California where we had massive fires. Never had happened before like this in metropolitan areas. Uh, and of course, premiums right away jumped through the roof. Right, so premiums today are probably at least 60% higher than they were in 2018. Now, on top of that, underwriting standards tighten. If you wanna be able to buy fire insurance in these areas that are prone to risk, you cannot have a tree within 30 feet of your home, no two trees within 30 feet of each other, and then no brush for another 30 feet. So then what happened, 
On top of that, not only did the underwriting standards uh, increase, okay, but you probably also had to have, you know, um, you know, fire sprays, you know, detections if there was a fire in the house, the sprinklers come on. On top of that, the deductibles went way up. So you might have to eat not the first 5,000 in expenses, the first 20,000 in expenses. Uh, so that also reduced the risks as well. So you got tighter underwriting standards, bigger deductibles means the risks are no, now lower and the premiums are up 60%. Last year, uh, uh, well, and by the way, we had the same thing happen with earth, sorry, with uh, hurricane insurance in Florida after we had a series of years where we had some bad, uh, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes, which led to big losses. What did we have happen? Premiums went through the roof. The deductibles jump. You can't even get insurance now unless your home can, you know, it's got storm shutters that can withstand 140 mile an hour winds. It has to be a concrete or steel reinforced, you know, building. Uh, and last year, the fund I used uh, to invest, Stone Ridge's reinsurance premium, after losing money four of the previous six years, and it had five billion of assets before that period started. It was down to one billion as investors flee. Last year, the fund returned 44.6%. But most investors were gone because of engaging in recency bias and resulting. In fact, here's a great example. The CEO of Stone Ridge, a fellow named Ross Stevens, went and calculated the return of the fund versus the returns investors in the fund earn. And he found something very common, and we've talked about this before, investors dramatically underperform the very funds they invest in because investors came flying in because the first three years, the fund that had spectacular returns, uh, you know, far outperforming riskless treasure, and you have a totally uncorrelated asset producing, you know, very strong years. So money came flying in. Then you had a series of bad years, three losses in a row, a good uh, up five, down five, up five. So you lost money four out of the six. And now it was down to one billion. And most of the investors weren't there when the fund returned 44.6%. So we have the same self-healing mechanism but it only works if you're able to follow Warren Buffett's advice. Okay. There's a couple of things I want to visit on this, but before we get into that, in your book, your complete guide to factor-based investing in the back of it, you highlight a list of some different instruments that could be, you know, used either funds or ETFs to get exposure to some of these different factors. Um, but I didn't see at that time um, this, you know, related to let's say the insurance or reinsurance stuff. I'm just curious, like, what is, what are some options, obviously not advice, but just what are some options for what someone could use as an yeah. instrument for that? Well, so that book, Factor-Based Investing, dealt with factors. There are other asset classes that aren't factors. Okay. So we covered that in my second edition of Reducing the Risk of Black Swans. Uh, we didn't include it because a lot of these vehicles were not available when the first edition came out. We also included in my book, Your Suc uh, Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement. So what you're looking for are assets that meet the same criteria we established in our factor book, Andy Birkin and I, that there's a premium that is persistent over long periods of time, pervasive around the globe and across industries, sectors, countries, regions, because we want to make sure it's not a result of data mining. It should be robust to various definitions, if that's appropriate, like value and momentum work for various metrics you can use. There has to be an intuitive reason to believe the premium will <coughs> persist, like reinsurance. Insurance companies are in the profit-making business. They don't write insurance to lose money. So they're going to price for where they think the risks are. 
They know they're not going to make money every year. Sometimes the risks show up. But over the long term, they're very likely to come out ahead if they are prudent. So no one likes to buy insurance. You know you're highly likely to be transferring profits. You do it to cover losses you can't withstand. So why wouldn't you want to be on the other side of that trade and capture the insurance premium where you're not at individually at risk? Right. That's a very logical, intuitive premium. And it has to survive transactions costs. So examples of that, I use a long, short factor fund that goes long the, the positive side of a factor. So it would go long value, short growth, long positive momentum, short negative no momentum, long quality, short junk, long carry with high interest rates and short carry with low interest rates. So there's a fund run by AQR that's called the Alternative Risk Premium Strategy. Uh, its symbol is QRPRX for those who are using taxable accounts and QSPRX for those who are in tax advantage accounts. Uh, Stone Ridge runs uh, a reinsurance fund. Uh, it's SRRIX that invests in what are called quota shares, sharing the risks put on by about 10 of the leading reinsurers in the world. And they also have a cat bond fund, which I prefer not to use because it's more concentrated in US hurricane risk. And you give up the illiquidity premium you gain in quota shares. So the expected return is lower. But if you want liquidity, that's a good fund uh, to use. That's another example of that. There's private credit which gets the benefit of this self-healing mechanism. Uh, but private credit is illiquid. I use a fund run by Cliffwater. It's all floating rate, senior secured and sponsored by private equity. So you have them as hopefully backstopping, prepared to add equity if things get desperate because they'll get wiped out if the creditors come in and take over the company. It's not a guarantee they will, but... It can happen, and that's an extra layer of protection. An index that Cliffwater has of those types of loans, which today have average LTVs of about 40%, shows 22 basis points of credit losses. Mm. Almost no defaults and 70% recovery rates, and the current yield is 12%. That's a much better yield than you're getting on Vanguard's high yield bond fund, which has significantly worse credit experience, but you're getting daily liquidity. But most people don't need liquidity. And mm -hmm. there you're also taking about seven years or so of duration risk. So those are some examples uh, of funds that you can access that have somewhat low or totally uncorrelated to the risks of stocks and bonds. I have about 40% of my portfolio and I've been moving that up towards 50 in those assets plus some others. I own a life settlement fund. I'm in a private real estate vehicle uh, as well. Uh, I'm in a private oil and gas venture as a diversifier in case you get negative supply shocks uh, there uh, as well. So. And just uh, to wrap it up, um, reducing the risk of black swans is what what someone's going to get when they when they buy that and read that is is understanding first of all that it's a major risk, and the second one is your strategies for dealing with that. Yeah. So what the biggest thing that people are afraid of are these say black swan events that can happen. Now, let's say a war in the Middle East. I wouldn't call that a black swan. That's a white swan. It's a risk we know is there, but we don't know it's going to erupt into a global conflict, mm. all right? Uh, but the you know you have the U.S. budget deficits. Where that's another I would call white swan. I mean, it's certainly possible the U.S. will fail to pass a budget and we'll have a shutdown of the government, and we don't know what that could do, right? Right. Uh, so what investors, particularly those in retirement, who are subject to what is called sequence risk doesn't matter what the long-term returns are. If you start to withdraw money 
and right away you get negative returns, you can really have a problem because you can't recover, even if the market does, because you're drawing down and those assets are now gone. Those assets cannot recover. So if you start you know, taking assets out in 1966, at the beginning of the worst period for stocks and bonds we've ever had, you're typically bankrupt in about nine years, <laughs> even though returns were great over the last 60 years, starting then. So that's a real problem. I gave that example in my retirement book in the right. section on C. So we want to focus on how can we cut down the tail risks, risks that when they come, cause people to panic and sell. And the way you do that is you have to add assets that don't look like stocks and bonds. And then you can't complain when your portfolio doesn't look like the market because you did it intentionally. <laughs> you don't want to engage in resulting. There will be periods when it will underperform, like last year, right? Because the S&P was the best performer. But in 2022, every one of my alternatives was up, some as high as in the 25% range. Mm -hmm. So that was a year when it did work very well. 2008 would have been another you know, good year. So you have to avoid this engaging and resulting and understand why vehicles are in your portfolio in the first place. That's a great wrap up. Um, I'm going to just highlight to the listeners and viewers to, you know, that your complete guide to factor-based investing and also how to reduce the risk of black swans are two excellent books. And uh, Larry, I recently um, bought a random walk down Wall Street because I haven't, I haven't read that since, you know, I originally read it. I'm looking at my original one here, which was- It's now like two, the eighth edition or something? Oh, it's 13th, I think now 13th. is what it is. But the one I have, I bought in 2007. But I I saw excellent reference in there to your complete guide to factor-based investing. And uh, I thought that was that was great where you- it, in there, and then also looking at the one from 2007, he's made some reference to your book, uh, "Rational Investing in Irrational Times." So, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, so, I'm really proud because Burton Malkiel certainly is one of the giants, and he has written the forwards to several of my books, and has written blurbs recommending many of my books. So. It doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, that's that's the all-star list. So that's cool. And I'll have links to those in the show notes. And Larry, I want to thank you again for another great discussion, thinking about how we're creating, growing, and most importantly, today, we learned a lot about protecting our wealth. And for those uh, out there who want to keep up with Larry, which is not easy to keep up with Larry because he's producing uh, Larry, you can meet him. You can see him at uh, Twitter at Larry Swedro and also on LinkedIn. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott saying, I'll see you on the upside.